and it's going to replace that light with the sun. We go on, and now they were for seasons and for days and for years. So not only were the stars set there for signs, they were there for time. We talked about days already, but they're for seasons. What are they talking about? Well, as the earth goes around the sun, different constellations will show up in the night sky. So at night, you can take a look at the constellations. You can tell what season you're in. So the question is, is when Uriah, or Uriah, the hunter, shows up in the night sky, does any of you know what season it is? Want me to tell you what season it is? It is hunting season. <laughs> now I'm a hunter. Now I have rheumatoid arthritis. I do not take drugs. I can try to control my diet, take supplements. One thing that works very good with rheumatoid arthritis is elk meat. I can eat elk meat and it doesn't affect me. I gotta be very careful with chicken and beef and pork. If I eat too much, I will start stiffening up. Elk doesn't have a problem. So it is very important that I'm out there hunting on hunting season if I like to eat meat. So, but that's basically fall, winter. Okay. So you can tell what season it is by looking at the constellations at night. And we go on, and for years. Well, we take a look at the week. Where does the week come from? Not from the motions of the heavenly hopes. It only comes from scripture. That's where we get the week from. The day comes from the earth rotating on its axis. The month roughly comes from the moon going around the earth. And the year comes from the earth going around the sun. Now, if the year comes by the earth going around the sun, that means what day did the earth or the year start? Day number four. That was the beginning of the first year. Before that, there were no years. Now, if we did not have a sun or a moon or so on, if we just had God's light shining on the earth, we're rotating, how, how would you get evidence or how would you inform somebody on how old you are? You couldn't use a year because there was no sun. Are you all with me here? Well, if there was just a day, and there would also be a week, you would have to give your age in weeks or days. So if we didn't have a son, and somebody asked me how old I am, I would have to say I'm 19,640 days old. And then tomorrow I'll be 19,641 days old. You know, that would get old pretty quickly, wouldn't it? Actually, this is already outdated. I don't know how old I am by days. <laughs> but is it a lot easier to give your age in years? Yeah, it's far easier than they, especially when you get my age, the numbers get really, really big. So, this year, the year started on this day. So do we know how old Adam was when he died? Yes, the Bible says he was 930 years old. There were no, again, no years before this day. In Psalms 139, the sun is put there to rule the day, and the moon was there to rule the night. As we see this, and God made two great lights, that's the sun, the greater light to rule, or the two great lights, the greater light is the sun to rule the day, and the lesser light, the night, moon to rule the night. And he made the stars also. Interesting. And he made the stars, which means he did not create the stars. The word made means he made the stars out of something he already created on day one. Create means you're creating something out of nothing. It wasn't there, then God makes some, creates something out of nothing. So he made the stars. Well, we're going to take a look at star formation. Did stars evolve or were they made? The Bible says stars cannot make themselves. Somebody has to make the stars. That's what the Bible says. I was taught in astronomy class that stars could make themselves. There's no need for God. All that was out there was this hydrogen gas. Then the gravitational attraction of hydrogen gas, gas, hold that gas together and then closer together and closer together until these gas molecules were so close together they were sticking together. And then more gas stuck together, more hydrogen gas stuck together. And then he had this big round ball of gas and the friction of molecules were heating things up. And it got hotter and hotter. And all of a sudden, that hydrogen gas had 
denied it, we get the sun. That's what I was taught. That doesn't fit with physics at all. Let's, let's take a look. Let's take a look at the properties of gases. <coughs> One of the properties of gases is they fill the container that they're in. The gas in this room pumps up little balls and falls to the floor, right? Is that what it does? It's a good thing it doesn't do that, otherwise we'd be sucking air. Gases always fill the container that they're in. Guess what gases do in outer space? They try to fill the container that they're in. That's right. See, this is called gas pressure. See, there's a force, gravitational attraction between the molecules. That's a force. It's a very, very weak force. That's why gases stay gases. But gas pressure is a very strong force. Gases want to push out. We also got the law of inertia going on here. We won't talk about that, though. And so this is from Gillette, Wyoming. Up in Gillette, Wyoming, they have a lot of coal. This is my wife, Sue. This is one of those coal trucks there. So we're talking a pretty good-sized truck, aren't we? This truck weighs empty 120 tons. That's a pretty heavy truck. It carries 170 tons of coal. So fully, fully loaded, it's about 300 tons. What do they put in this tire to keep the tires inflated? Air. Does air have a lot of pressure? Yes, it can hold up tons and tons of weight. It doesn't want to clump together. It wants to do what? Push out. Yes. And then when, when gases heat up, what happens to the gas pressure? Drastically increases. That's why it's so dangerous to throw an aerosol can in fire, because if that air gets too hot inside that aerosol can, what happens to the can? It'll literally, 100 degrees, 200 degrees, 300, it'll literally rip that metal apart. Now, when I was a kid, I was not very bright. Things have not changed much. <laughs> don't do this, kids. You don't like to do when I was a kid? Throw yourself cans of fire. <laughs> Run around the shed, watch them blow up. Oh, it's cool. <laughs> I was playing with bombs. And all I was working with was, was gas. Don't do this, please. Okay? It is not cool. Mm. Oh. Now, mm. steam locomotives. They're all built on the, the principle of expansion of hot air. Did you know that? You get that water so hot, it boils and changes into water vapor. That water vapor, that gas pressure is so much pressure, they can move tons and tons of weight. Up in northern Minnesota, they had these huge iron ore mines. They had huge locomotives that weighed tons and tons. They were huge. They could move tons of all built on the principle of expansion of hot gas. Talked about Mount St. Helens the other day. Mount St. Helens, a volcano western coast of the United States, it blew the top off this mountain. What caused that mountain to explode? I mean, it blew off roughly three quarters of a cubic mile of material off the top of that mountain. That's a lot of material to move, isn't it? What caused the explosion? The explosion was caused by a superheated liquid water when it flashed into steam. When that side of that mountain gave way, that water changed into steam and it blew the top off of that mountain. It was about the pressure of about 20,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs. All on the expansion of hot gas. Can stars form themselves? No way. Scientifically, they cannot. We know that. They know that. But once we reject the truth, what is there to believe in? What's there to believe in when we reject the truth? A lie. And if you believe one lie, another lie is just as easy to believe in the other one. It's not a problem. Once you reject the truth, you can deceive people so easily. It's not a problem at all. It is very, very easy to deceive people when they reject the truth. And then God set them in the firmament. That means God did not make the stars where we see them tonight. It's not where he made them. He made them someplace else and then moved them in the firmament into outer space where we see them. Isn't that interesting? How many of you, this word set is like setting a table. How many of you have ever set the table? When you set the table, are the plates already on the table? No, the plates are someplace else, then you put them on the table. That's what God's doing. He's setting the universe with stars. Well, this is what we have on day four. We got this.
this right here. This is the earth right here. That's what we live on here. Right here is the firmament. This is where he's going to put the sun, moon, and stars, and the planets, and all that good stuff. He did not make the sun, moon, and stars here. He made them someplace else. The question is, what did he make the sun, moon, and stars out of? Well, we only got this. There's not a lot of stuff there, but we got this water out here. I don't know if you remember on day two, he separated the waters from the waters, right? A little bit of water here, he's going to make the earth out of that. The water up above the firmament, he's going to do something else. He's not going to make the stars out of this, but he has to make the stars out of this water right here. Because he made them. He didn't create the stars, he made the stars. So he made them out of this material, which is water, and then he moved them into the firmament. Interesting. Now, what I find interesting is this. The three most abundant elements in the universe is hydrogen, helium, and oxygen. What's water? H2O. Most of the universe is made up of hydrogen. Third element is oxygen. It wasn't a big deal for God to make stars out of water, was it? Yeah, they, they reported it's water coming out of stars. Did you know that? They discovered water coming out of stars? Interesting. Yes. The most abundant compound in the universe is what? Water. It's no surprise to me because God made everything out of what? He's just got some of that water left up there. He's got to make something, maybe he'll make something else out of it. I, know. I find all this chemistry just fascinating. We're talking about the earth. The most abundant element on the earth is oxygen. What's water made up of? H2O. Now, we're going to take a look at planets. According to what we know about gravity, the Earth should be here. But it is. It should be here according to gravity. Interesting. If you want to know more about what I'm talking about, there's a friend of mine. His name is Spikes Caceres. He's got three DVDs out there on astronomy. If you want to know more about astronomy, I highly recommend buying the three DVDs. He goes into much more detail than I'm talking about here. Basically, Somebody had to make the universe. That's the bottom line, scientifically. Somebody had to make it. Because it can't make itself. Well, here's the rocky planets. Now, they changed the definition of the word planet, so Pluto is now kicked out. He's not no longer a planet. It's a dwarf planet. I got kind of bummed. I kind of like Pluto. It's a neat planet. It's got five moons. Now, but they had to do that, otherwise they had to model some other objects in its planets, so they just kicked out one. That's beside the point. But here's, here's the Earth right here. These are all to scale, one with another. That's all the size of another. Here's India. Now, on the other side of this planet, this works very well in India, because they didn't, that's where I teach sometimes. Right on the other side of this planet is Belmont, California. <laughs> so, impress in your mind where you are on this Earth, okay? Because we're going to compare these planets to that of the gas planets. These are the gas planets. There's the Earth. We're on the other side of this round ball. What is the scale? Now we're going to compare the planets to the sun. All the scale. There's the Earth. You can still see where you're on the other side of that round black dot, right? Now we're going to compare the sun with stars in our galaxy. And by the way, the sun is a very, very unique star. It is not an ordinary star. It's very, very unique. It's a very special star. Yes. And those DVDs go into more detail. Now we're going to compare the sun with other stars in our galaxy. Now there's the sun. Right there is Jupiter. And how many of you have really good eyesight and can see the Earth? There's Arcturus. Now Arcturus is not the biggest star in our galaxy. There's Arcturus. That was the big star in the last picture. There's the sun right there, and there's Antares. Now, Antares is still not the biggest star in our galaxy. As far as we know, Canis Majoris is the largest star in our galaxy. Now, Canis Majoris basically means big dog star. Is it a big star? It is huge, yes. There's our sun right beside Canis Majoris. Canis Majoris is about Saturn's orbit around the sun. Is that a big star? It is huge. According to what we know about the properties of gases, somebody has to take the gases, hydrogen, compress it, compress it, compress it, increase it, heat, increase it, heat, compress it, compress it, increase it, heat, 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 increase it, heat,
increase the heat compressing to the molecules, molecules hold it together. Are we talking power here? And then, by the way, where we see it, it's not where God made it. He made it someplace else and then moved it. So now we're talking about the law of inertia. Somebody's got to move that object and then stop it. Are we talking power here? You haven't even begun to see power. We're just getting started. Yeah. Here's a picture of a galaxy. There's about 100 to 200 billion stars on average on, in every galaxy. That's a lot of stars. This is a picture of our galaxy, a part of it, by a telescope. This picture of space is about the size of a dime, a hand's length from your eye, because that's, that's all the space we're looking at here. Okay? In this picture, there are only two stars. There's a star there, there's a star there. You know what all these other white objects are? They're all galaxies. It's like that throughout the whole universe. Every one of those stars had to be made, and every one of those stars had to be put in their place, and everything runs like clockwork. Are we talking power here? When a being has that much power, do we argue against that being? When that being speaks, what do we do? Whatever you say. You don't tell that being he doesn't know what he's talking about, do you? When the person got that being has that much power. When we take a look at the Milky Way galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy is only a speck of dust in the universe. That's all it is, it's just a speck of dust. In the Milky Way galaxy, there's our solar system, which is only basically a speck of dust in our solar system. In the middle of that solar system, there's another speck of dust called the sun. And orbiting the sun, there's another speck of dust called the earth. And on this planet Earth, there's a lot of specks of dust, and that's us. Now, how many of you are feeling really, really big now? Interesting. I hope that puts us in our place really, really quickly. If this is not humbling, I don't know what is. This shows God's omnipotence, His power. What about light? People say, oh, what about light? You know, these are... Light years have nothing to do with time. Light years has to do with distance. That's all it is. It's a measuring stick. People think light years has time. No. Just like a mile. A mile has nothing to do with time, does it? If you walk a mile, ride a bike a mile, drive a car a mile, fly a plane a mile, time all changes. We're discovering that the speed of light is not a constant. We knew that for years. Every time light travels through a different medium, it changes speed. That's why light bends when it goes through water and glass and over, because it's changing speed. We knew that for a long time. This whole thing about light being a constant, I don't know where they come from that stuff. Oh, it might be a constant going through a vacuum, but boy, when it changes to another medium, it changes speed. You know, researchers have been able to store light. You know, they've been able to stop light and start it up again. I mean, this is crazy. They've discovered that the speed of light could be 300 times faster going through cesium gas than it runs through a vacuum. We now know that space is not empty space. There's stuff out there. Oh. Also, this is new scientist. This is not coming from a creationist. Heresy, the change the speed of light, and you can rewrite the history of the universe. If the speed of light is a constant, the Big Bang's dead. Throw it out. Major problem with the speed of light being a constant with the Big Bang belief system. The guy goes in more detail. If you want more information, just talk to me. Basically, they're saying that the speed of light had to be much faster in the past than it is today to explain what we see. Wow. The speed of light was 10 billion times faster than time zero. Now, they already knew about this going back to 1987. This is not new stuff. You've heard about all this, haven't you? Oh. Oh. So the whole thing of galaxies being out there far away means nothing. <laughs> With time. Well, our scientists now have zoomed our telescopes into the nucleus of this Whirlpool galaxy. This Whirlpool galaxy sits at about 90 degree angle to our Earth. So we can zoom our telescopes into that nucleus there. You know what they saw? This is what they saw. What is that? Who created all the stars or made all the stars and put them in their place? Jesus Christ did. That person that went on the cross died for a speck of dust like me. Did you know that? Wow. Why would somebody who makes all the stars and put them in their place die for dust like me? I cannot figure it out. The only way I can
can rationalize this is that he must love us a lot for him to die for me. It's the only way I can rationalize it. That means you have value. You have a tremendous amount of value. Did you know that? Because somebody has to love you very, very much to go through all the pain to die on the cross. Isn't that interesting? You know what's also more interesting than that? I get a little long-winded. I'm on a rabbit trail, but I just love rabbit trails. God knows everybody's thought, right? Does he not know everybody's thoughts before you can think them? That means he feels everybody's pain. Did you know that? He feels everybody's pain. When a child is being aborted, he feels the pain of that child being aborted. Did you know that? When people went on the cross to die, you know he, God felt their pain. So for Jesus Christ dying on the cross, it was a big deal. But he knew the pain it was going to take to go on the cross because he feels everybody's pain who was ever crucified. So why was he sweating blood before he went to the cross? Because he already, feels the, he already felt the pain. Are you with me here? Why was he dreading to go to the cross? You know why? He felt the pain of the cross. I don't think that was, I don't think that was the problem. But of all of eternity, he had never been separated from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Never. When God the Father puts all the sins of mankind on Jesus Christ, that trinity is broken. That unity in the trinity is broken. Are you with me? Jesus Christ could not handle the division of that breaking relationship with God the Father for taking on sins. That's why he's for blood. Because he gets, goes on the cross and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The relationship is broken because he took on our sins. Sin breaks relationships. If the, if the creator of the universe that built, put all, made all those stars and put them in their place, if he sweats blood because of the broken relationship with God the Father, how must he feel with a broken relationship with us? How much he feels when people don't trust Christ as Savior and they die, and that broken relationship is forever? God weeps over broken relationships. Does he want a relationship with you? He is dying for a relationship with you. And he's made a way, and that's through Jesus Christ. That's interesting. Now, come to the end of day number four, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day, and that brings us into day number five. And God said, let the waters. Now God's going to work with waters here. Bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly about the earth in an open firmament of heaven. Here we have the word open. This is the same word as face in Genesis 1 2. That means the birds do not fly in the firmament. Is, it a, is there a good reason why it's, it's not good for birds to fly in the firmament? In the firmament, there is no oxygen, that's outer space. So they don't fly in the firmament because it's not good to be flying in the firmament because there's no air there to breathe. So they fly in an open firmament. That means they fly just in front of the firmament. Which means here is the open firmament of heaven. Birds fly in the atmosphere. Here was that water canopy before the flood. It's now gone. And then above that we have the firmament. So look at Genesis 7.23. The, fowl, the fowls of the air the fowl of heaven. That means... Atmosphere is heaven number one, where the sun, moon, and stars are, are heaven number two, and you go way up there beyond this other water, and that is heaven number three. The Bible talks about, Genesis talks about three heavens. Yeah. We talked about that the other day, on day number two. Now, again, it talks about after their kind, after his kind, and they're supposed to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. We're going to talk more about being fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. You know that is a very scientific concept? Because Darwin did not understand the scientific concept of verse 22. He made a blunder. And we're going to talk about that when we get into day number six. Okay? We'll go into more detail. So he created everything to reproduce after their own kind. Yes. 
And there would be fruitful multiply, and again, always be produced after growth pattern. We're going to talk more about this. This is a very scientific statement right there. Extremely scientific. Uh, so what did God do on day five? He made the flying features. That includes the birds, the flying reptiles, the flying mammals, the flying insects. Also, he made the marine features. Marine reptiles, marine mammals, fish, and so on. So everything that lives in the sea and everything that flies in the air, he made on day five. And then God created. Now here we have the word create. <clears throat> the last time we had that word create is in Genesis chapter 1 1. After that, it's always make or appear or so on. So God created something new on day number five. That means animals have something that plants and rocks and water do not have. So the question is what do animals have that rocks and plants don't have? Thinking process. Yes, this word feature is actually nephish in the Hebrew. What is nephish? It's the mind, it's the mind, it's the soul. Living being with life and the blood is the activity of mind. Do animals have a thinking process? Yes, they do. Yes, when we take a look at Numbers 22, we're talking about Balaam's donkey. You know, I think the donkey was more famous than Balaam was. Actually, the donkey was more godly than Balaam was not a very good prophet. Then the Lord God opened the mouth of the donkey and she said, God did not speak to the donkey. The donkey spoke. Does the donkey have intelligence? Yeah. Now, I'm a hunter and I, when I hunt, I like to use horses. And so we've got, between my son and I, we have three horses. And there's one horse I like to ride and her name is Misty. Misty and I have a love-hate relationship. Did you know that? I love her, and boy, do I hate her. She has a thinking process, and she has an attitude pro problem. Okay? I love to try to think her thoughts. She can figure things out. She can do all kinds of stuff. Do you want to hear a story about Misty? Okay. Now, we got these three horses. They don't like to be in the rear. They either like to be first or second, but they don't really like to take up the last place. So we're up in the mountains, we got this little trail, I'm riding Misty, and I'm leading them. And my two sons are behind me. So we come out of this, we're on this trail, we're headed back to camp. And we come out of, off of the, out of the woods, and we go into this nice open meadow. And these two horses behind me, they take off, they don't want to be last, so they just run past Misty. Misty does, I'm not doing anything. I'm letting Misty just go. So Misty takes off running, and she's running. And she can't catch up with the other two. But what happens, the trail goes this way, and then it turns an L shape like this, and our camp is over here. So those two horses, they're ahead of me, and they're running. Misty decides, shortcut. <laughs> <laughs> she's doing this all on her own. I'm not doing anything. She just takes off the trail, and she's running. Now, to get between, between where I'm riding and between the camp is a creek. Misty does not like to go across water. It's always a pain to get her to get across the street. So I am trying to think Misty's thoughts, trying to anticipate what she's going to do. So she's running, she's getting closer to the creek, she's running, she's getting closer to the creek, and she is not slowing down. My conclusion is she's going to jump, jump the creek. So I jump her down. I mean, I'm down, hands on the horn, and she jumps the creek. Jumps the creek, Gets on back on the trail, passes the two other horses, <laughs> slows down, the other two come in right behind her, and she gets, isn't that interesting? She thought that off. I didn't do a thing. <laughs> when they do these research on animals, they say, oh, they can think and figure things out and communicate. Big deal. I could have told them that. Why waste all their money? Just read scripture. No. No. There was a parrot, an African gay parrot, gray parrot. He's now deceased, but this parrot was trained to count the six and describe a hundred different objects. Did he understand what he's talking about? When it comes to the brain, the bird brain is probably your closest relative. So when somebody calls you a bird brain, what do you say? Thank you. <laughs> now, I've got a friend that has an African gray parrot. You can talk to the people. You know, you know how strange it is to talk to an animal and it talks back? <laughs> you leave, you say goodbye, and it says goodbye. It's, I mean, Parents are interesting creatures. They really are. Yes. Then we have evening, morning, the fifth day. Then we 
we go into day number six. This is going to be a big day. Yeah, so I got a few minutes here. Well, first thing, are there any questions before I go into this day? No questions? Grasping all this information? Good, thank you. All right, if you need more information, we do have books on that that go into more detail. So I'm just doing a really quick overview because when I do my astronomy program, it takes about an hour to do it with my astronomy program and I'm just covering the surface. But this guy has three DVDs and goes in more detail. So, day six. And God said, let the earth bring forth a living creature. Again, now we're talking about earth. God's gonna work with the earth here. And he's going to make cattle, he's going to make the creeping thing, and the beasts of the earth. Now, God categorizes his creatures a little bit differently than we categorize ours. He's got the cattle, which I look at it as domestic creatures. Creeping things, lizards, things that bugs, things that creep on the ground, beasts of the earth, probably like that of the, maybe like the elephants and the giraffes and so on. Okay, so this is what he's talking about here. And he got after his kind, after his kind, and it goes on after his kind, after their kind, after his kind. It's like a broken record. When God repeats himself, I sit up and take notice. Is he trying to tell us something? Yes. What's he trying to tell us? Everything reproduces after their own kind. Is that scientific? Yes, that has never been broken. Everything. Everything is reproduced after their own kind. They have never discovered that something will change into something else. We're going to go into more detail on it. So when, you, when they tell you that some kind of creature changed into a completely different kind of creature, there's no science behind it at all. It's all speculation. It's all speculation. They're speculating. I don't deal with speculation. I deal with observational science, repeatable. Speculation is not science. No, so we don't want to speculate. We get into Charles Darwin, all he did was speculate. It's all speculation. There was no science there at all. The only science he had there proved the Bible to be true. So God made the dog kind. What those dogs looked like, we don't know for sure, but they were what? Dogs. So all the dog genes we have today go back to the original dogs. Yes. And then God told them to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Yes. Well, therefore the creatures are designed with a very complex informational system. Is DNA very complex? Mind-boggling complex. To adapt to their environment, so God programmed creatures to adapt to their environment. If these creatures are supposed to fill the earth, they have to have the ability to do what? To adapt or change. If they do not adapt or change to different environments, they will do what? Probably go extinct. It's exactly what we see in science. So the Bible already teaches that creatures will change. Species will change, but kinds will not. Kinds will only change to adapt to their environment. Yes. But also genetically stable not to change into something else. This is very scientific, and this all comes from Genesis. Darwin didn't understand this. Because he didn't understand this, he came up with a blunder. Because he lacked information, he came up with a false philosophy which is not really anything new, he just borrowed from other people. So, they got told to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, so they would change to fit all these different environments before the flood. We don't know all the environments before the flood, but there are a lot of different environments after the flood. I'm gonna give you an example. This is a very simple example, but hopefully I'll get the information across. We have diff many different environments today. We have desert environments, we have steppe environments, we have mountain environments, we have rainforest environments, we have arctic tundra environments. After the flood, God said, be fruitful, multiply. And they should try to fill the earth. It's going to be more difficult after the flood than before the flood. It was a lot nicer before the flood than after. It's probably like Belmont, California, all over the earth, except a little more rain. Okay? Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Okay, so, God created the dog kind. So, male, female dogs. What they actually look like, we don't know for sure, but they look like dogs. Now, these dots here represent dog genes. Again, it's far more complex than this, this is simplified version. So, we get all these different dog genes. Now, some of these dogs are going to adapt to the rainforest environment. Well, what happens is, some of these dog genes are selected, that the, the, the dog genes 
that work well in a rainforest environment are selected through natural selection. I believe in natural selection. Natural selection is no friend to evolution. If you understand natural selection of genetics, it's devastating to evolutionary philosophy. And I'll teach you. I'll show you that. So natural selection, now natural selection doesn't produce any new genes, does it? Natural selection only works on the genetic material that's there. Natural selection weeds out the genes that don't work. The genes that do work are selected. So here we have natural, through natural selection and adaptation, some of these dogs will adapt to a rainforest environment. Then some of these dogs, the filled earth, will adapt to a mountain environment. So natural selection will pick the dog genes that work well in the mountain environment. Now the question is, does this dog look exactly like this dog? No. But did they all got their dog genes from original dog kind? Yes. Now, can this dog change into this dog? No, it's lost these dog genes, so it can't change into this dog. It can stay this dog. What we see here is natural selection causes a reduction of genetic diversity. Well, that's a problem for evolution, because what do you need for evolution? You have to increase the genetic diversity in the creature to get it to change into something else. Are you all with me? Now, I used to farm. This is nothing new. We dealt with this all the time. I worked with this. I worked with purebreds, hybrids, all this. Working with purebreds is the same thing as natural selection. Did you know that? With dealing with purebreds, I eliminated genes that I was looking for certain characteristics in pigs. So to get those certain characteristics and what advantages, I had to eliminate genes and just select other genes. This is nothing. I work with this all the time as a farmer. This is nothing. This is not a big scientific. I mean, farmers work with this. That's our livelihood. We have to understand genetics because we live with plants and animals, and that's how we make our living. Interesting. So it causes a reduction of genetic diversity. This is called gene depletion or information depletion. These features are less likely to change. So natural selection actually causes features less likely to change because they reduce genetic diversity. Are you all with me here? Does it make sense? Good. So they taught me, oh, natural selection work, helps out. No, it doesn't. It's an enemy. It's devastating to, to evolution. This is the opposite of Darwinian evolution. What they say about mutations, we'll talk about mutations. Mutations are not good. Not good at all. No. So natural selection only does selects the best of that kind to survive in that environment. That's all it does. That's what the Bible predicted 6,000 years ago. People need to read scripture so they can properly interpret scientific information. Otherwise, they make a blunder. Basically, it's natural selection prevents creatures from changing into a completely different kind of creature. See, according to the Bible, God made distinct kinds. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. So these creatures will change through adaptation and natural selection to fit all these different environments. Is, that, is this actually what we see? It's exactly what we see in science. And I will demonstrate that even in their books. I will use their books to demonstrate this is exactly what they see. Wow. Interesting. Now, according to research, all the dogs we have today all the dogs we have today can easily come from an ancestral dog. But that dog is still what? A dog. They didn't get it from a finch or a cat. It's a dog. Yes. This is what we call microevolution. Microevolution is biblical and scientific. Bible and science always goes hand in hand. It's also called microadaptation or variation of a kind or speciation of a kind. We're going to talk more about species. There's a big confusion about what a species is. Actually, they don't really know for sure what a species is. But we'll talk about it. I kind of don't like to use microevolution because sometimes that's very confusing. But microevolution is just small changes within the kind. Look around this room, we all look the same, do we not? Is there one person who looks a little bit strange than most of you? Yes. This is microevolution. We're going to talk about microevolution. Yes. Now, so. We got all these variations of dogs fitting, fit, filling the earth and all these different environments before the flood. Along came the flood. How many dogs went on board the ark? Two dogs. 
Now, this is all very scientific information. You, we have to all understand this to understand why we find strange things in the fossil record. If you don't understand this, you're going to make some mis mistakes when you identify the fossils in the fossil record. Yes. Because if you start with the wrong premises, the wrong starting point, you come up with the wrong conclusion. So only two dogs went on board the ark. That means we got all these, so after the flood again, will be fruitful, multiply, try to fill the earth. And we have all these dogs today. All these dogs here today basically came from the genetics that came off the ark. And that's not a problem. Genes are very complex. This is what we call speciation. But this is not evolution, is it? Because they're still all what? Dogs. This is microevolution. When a dog changes into something that's no longer a dog, now we have Darwinian evolution. Until we see that, Darwinian evolution is not scientific. Are you with me? Yes. This is also speciation. So we have all these variations of dogs before the flood. All kinds of different dogs. Now, species will change. We know that according to Genesis chapter 1. But kinds will <coughs> You know what natural selection does? Natural selection brings extinction. What natural selection does is find human creatures to to be very fruitful in that environment. It keeps eliminating genes. So it keeps, keeps refining features to be very well in those certain environments. If that environment changes, and if that creature does not have the genetic diversity to adapt to a new, env new environment, what happens to that creature? We all know. What is it called? It goes extinct. It dies. That's why they're trying to keep ecosystems intact, because if that ecosystem change, if that creature does not have the ability to adapt to a new ecosystem, it will what? Die. Well, if evolution is true, just let them die. It's why we're the fittest, right? Who cares? They're not fit to live. You know, they don't even practice what they believe. They basically are practicing biblical principles, and they don't realize it because the Bible is scientific. They'll just evolve into something else. Mutations that come along, they'll evolve in something else, right? That's what I was taught. But you know, creatures have the creatures are very complex. They can really adapt to different environments. A lot of that stuff is false. I mean, they're extremely capable of adapting. Because they, their DNA is not simple, like what I was taught in college because of evolution. DNA is very complex because of what I was taught in scripture, because God is very intelligent and things are very complex. Everything he does is extremely complex and work. That's exactly what we find. You gotta start, start with the right starting point, otherwise you're making mistakes. Yeah. If these dog genes here, if these dog genes did not go on board the ark with these dogs here, what happened to these variations of dogs? Anybody know? They would go extinct. You would not see them today, and that explains what we see in the fossil record. I'm going to go more in detail in the next hour, or right now I'm out of time, so we're going to start right here in the next hour. Okay. All this information that I'm teaching you, you know where it comes from? Scripture. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Is there a lot of, is there a lot of scientific information in Scripture? You better believe whoever wrote Genesis was a scientific genius. And we're going to get into more of it. I mean, that's where I like to start. I like to start with someone who knows everything and work from there. Yes. Okay, I'll turn it over to Pastor Kevin or should I just close in prayer? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay, is that yes or no? <laughs> um, if you can stay, it would be great if you can stay. So maybe we'll probably start back in about 15 minutes. Sounds good to me. About 15 minutes, and so, you know, you can mingle, uh, go greet each other. Uh, but we're planning to have Sunday school uh, to cover the rest of Genesis 1, start Genesis chapter 2. And then the second service is, is going as much of Genesis 2 as we can. Right? We're going to hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Yes. If you have questions, come. Uh, uh, you're welcome to come talk to Rich. Our great stuff. Let's uh, let's let's pray. Father, thank you for um, thank you for your word and for all that is contained in it, Lord. What what uh, wonderful 
revelation that you have when we study your word. It tells us a lot about what we really need to know to understand you and us and, and what our purpose is in life. Thank you, Lord, for uh, Rich coming to help us to, to understand Genesis 1 better, Genesis chapter 2, and creation. And we pray that this will strengthen our faith. It will help us to, to research the scriptures more, uh, to look into some of the resources that are here. Thank you, Lord, that you give us a word that we can believe. And so bless our time. So bless our time together, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. We'll see, we'll see you all in about 15 minutes. Thank you.